seems like the um, the live stream didn't show up on YouTube, and um, the software I was using had two different streams. One of which was called Start Streaming, and Start Streaming. The other one said Go Live, and I just pressed Start Streaming. Uh, so that was a mistake. But um, if this works, if one of you can can just um, yeah, okay, I'm seeing a message now from Tim saying that I am live, so I can just do this again. I'll go through the whole presentation again, and this will become a live stream. 30%, uh, too, 30, 30 minutes too late, but at least you, uh, you get to see a presentation uh, belatedly. Apologies. So, um, uh, yes, so today's discussion will be how to identify fraud through financial statements. And um, this is... Um, coming from the perspective of a long investor. And um, it is a little bit different type of analysis that short sellers would do. Um, and, and um, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't have the resources that a short seller has. I would not be able to identify the, the types of, um, of um, or, or verify, you know, the fact that assets exist and so on. So the research that I suggest that you do when it comes to financial statement analysis to identify fraud and earnings manipulation is a little bit different. Um, I'll just you know look at number of ratios. The whole analysis doesn't take more than 20 minutes, and you get to a pretty good um, view of whether a company is faking the numbers or not. Uh, so let's uh, first of all, I just want to make sure this is not investment recommendation. I don't claim that any of the companies discussed are frauds or manipulating earnings, and you should always consult your financial advisor, uh, just for education. And um, yeah, okay, so today's agenda uh, is um, 10 red flags. These are the 10 things that I suggest that you look at when you encounter a stock. And I'm already doing this analysis, uh, but this is, um, I'll go through each of them in detail. And st starting with a, an actual uh, financial statements and how uh, I would analyze it. Last, I would look at a case study called Mega Expo Holdings, uh, which has now been renamed uh, to Nova Group. And um, it's, uh, it was targeted by a short seller called Blue Orca. And uh, I think most, <laughs> hi Sinanda, uh, most, of, uh, most of people agree that the company definitely was, was uh, using very aggressive uh, accounting. So, uh, and then I'll end up with two recommended books as well, uh, books on the topic that I really like. So let's dig into this. So first metric that I think is useful um, is operating cash flow, and it's easy to check. You just check cash flow from operations. Is it lower than the net profit? Um, and what it, what, what it should be is CFO should be roughly the same as net profit plus depreciation and amortization. And if there's a dip discrepancy between those two, something is sucking up cash. Uh, it could be accounts receivables, they're not getting paid. It could be inventories. Uh, it could be anything that's really um, explaining the fact that they don't have much cash uh, in, in their accounts, uh, even though they have earnings. Something has to, you know, something has to make up for that difference. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, companies are forced to, uh, to, to, to come up with like if they want to report earnings, they need to have something offsetting uh, that number to, to, to get to cash flows, or they might be faking their bank statement. That's another um, uh, possibility. Then what you need to do is you dig deeper into that line item. Uh, for example, if the line item is about accounts receivable, you figure out the revenue recognition. Or if there's about inventories, you check the aging of inventories. Um, those are just two, two suggestions. You can dig deeper in any way. And uh, the particular item really depends. I've taken the example here on the right-hand side. It's from a company called Rönnsjö, uh, Shangye, like a Rönnsjö commercial. Um, turn up the recording. Okay, doing that a little bit. Hope, hopefully this works better. So on the right-hand side, you see the um, uh, cash flow statement from a company called Rönnsjö which I think produced uh, underground, they built underground parking garages. And um, just give me a second here. Uh, yeah. 
that should be enough. That should be fine. And okay, so the company, most of the profits uh, was actually came from gains and losses, uh, or, or rather um, fair value gains from a change in the valuation of their properties. And you would think that this is obvious, right? Most of their profits came from a change in fair value gains, a fair value gain. But this company was a institutional favorite in the BRICS bubble of 2010. And um, to be honest, people didn't see this coming because they didn't, they weren't reading the reports. They were just reading Celso reports or, uh, or the Bloomberg numbers. Um, next one uh, is operating margins. And I think this is specific for Asia because um, if the company is reporting high operating margins, typically in, in, in Europe, US, that, that probably means that they have some kind of moat. They have something special that enables them to charge high prices. But in, in, in Asia, I think most of the time, if, if you see that, most of the time there's something funny going on, especially if they're producing commodity products. If they're not producing a commodity product, uh, then, then maybe there's a good explanation. You can even ask the management team, why are your margins so high compared to the competitors? Is the, are there switching costs or network effects or scale advantages or something like that? Um, so there's always a reason for it. And very often, it's one of two things. It's either the fact that they have a sister company that takes some of the expenses, maybe they employ some of their uh, staff, and you don't see them in the list code. Or the second explanation could be that they're recycling cash. They Maybe they're buying up subsidiaries, stakes, stakes in subsidiaries, and funneling money through related parties that way. And, uh, and that money then ends up becoming revenues because the related parties then buy the company's products. And that revenue has you know, high contribution margins, so it ends up being leading to high margins for the company. Yeah, Hong Kong Water, exactly, exactly. That is uh, that, that's a good example, and th there are tons of companies like this in China. Uh, in fact, I mean, this example here is from Fuyao Glass. Uh, I don't, I don't even know if it's, if it's a fraud. Probably not. I mean, it's it's part of this Netflix show that you may have seen on uh, China Factory, something like that. Uh, so it, it may not be a fraud. There might be a good explanation for it. But at least this is enough for me to think, wow, I, I probably don't want to touch this. Um, the um, operating margins versus peers. Um, yeah. The, the uh, lower right hand uh, table here is from Geely. And the Lisco, rather, the Hong Kong listed uh, company, subsidiary of Geely's holding company. And you can see that the related party revenues was like 40% of, um, of uh, total revenues. And as cost of goods sold, it was like 60, 70%, 80% even of uh, cost, of goods, cost of goods sold. And that's a huge issue because the question is, how can we know that they're paying market-based prices for, those, uh, for whatever they're buying uh, or you know, whatever they're selling? Maybe they're not. I mean, how can you trust that the that the parent will um, or the, that the related party would, would treat them nicely? You can't. And uh, so that's that's a huge issue. Uh, I don't recall what I don't think Geely has high operating margin, but uh, related party uh, transactions could be an explanation for high operating margins if there's recycling of cash going on. Next one is high accounts receivables. This one is um, um, maybe quite obvious, but if the company is not getting paid, you should discount the revenues. You should you should take it with a grain of salt. Always, you can what you can do is two things. You can look at the accounts receivable days versus their uh, peers, or just in general. If it's if it's like you know three hundred or four hundred days or something, that's that's really high. Long-term receivables are particularly problematic because typically uh, customers pay within 90 days, depending on the industry, of course. Uh, what you then need to do is you look into the revenue recognition policies. And typically they need to satisfy four criteria, that there's an arrangement that delivery has occurred of the product, only then can you account for revenues, that there's a price and that there's collectability of, of, um, of that money. And um, 
uh, I find, especially in the property industry, there's a revenue recognition policy called cost to completion accounting. And that's really problematic because that allows the company to record revenues whenever they incur costs, which isn't very difficult to do. Uh, and who knows, you know, what a company is going to get paid eventually. You know, it's... Uh, so you very often see uh, accounts receivables related to cost, co cost of completion accounting. You can also compare the increase in the receivable accounts versus the increase in sales. If it's a big difference there, probably something fishy. You should discount the, uh, the earnings, earnings numbers then. And that's true for every company, not just frauds, by the way. Inventories. Um, um, by the way, uh, Sunana, I'm going to send out these slides to all of you later. Maybe um, put it on the Substack. Uh, next uh, slide here is about inventories. 36% uh, growth inventories here for Lenovo in, I don't know which year. Versus, you should compare that to the uh, cost of goods sold. And um, that's really high. It suggests that two things, I think. Either uh, there's very weak demand for the product. They're getting surprised by the weak demand. Um, and um, what, what they then do is they would probably, you would get a hit to sales eventually. You know, if, if inventory just piles up suddenly. Especially see that, you know, for fads, fad products uh, where, where demand just goes up and down um, or cyclical companies, they can also see have, you know, inventory increase, sudden inventory increases. And then I would look at folk finished product inventory because a change in raw material prices could also affect the valuation of raw materials inventory and work in progress. It could actually mean optimism. Finally, it could also mean earnings manipulation because if you're changing uh, end end of year inventory, that will actually mean that um, uh, you could use that. You can change the valuation of the ending inventory or beginning inventory, and use that to uh, to minimize cost of goods sold, and that thereby increase the the gross profit margin. Short term, some people accuse Tesla of having done that. And this one here is. Another obvious one, um, always check that. I mean, it's, and it's such, a, such an easy thing to do as well. Check whether they're paying tax. Check the, the uh, tax expense uh, in the income statement and compare that to pre-tax income. It should be roughly the same as statutory tax rate. If it isn't, you look in the footnote and you will probably find out um, you know, if there's an explanation. It could be tax breaks. You know, high-tech companies in China, for example, have tax tend to have tax breaks. Um, and um, but it could also mean that they just don't have taxable income, and and that's the that's the key point here. Maybe they don't have income in the eyes of the tax authority, so they're just reporting taxable income to foreign investors, or or to investors, whereas to the tax authority. They don't actually have an income. So here, 2011, a report of uh, Chowda, which is a company producing vegetables or some kind of crop in Fujian province. And I think it was probably went bankrupt or, yeah, the stock probably lost 90% plus, if I remember correctly. You can also check the, the uh, tax pay actually paid in the, um, in the cash flow statements. Yeah, exactly. Participatory holdings as well. I mean, this these methods are really uh, applicable to earnings manipulation as well. And I will get to that, by the way, because there's a good book on that topic on how you can adjust earnings uh, for um, for, um, for for just small changes to, in the assumptions uh, of in the accounting. For example, the depreciation period and so on. And um, if you want to do things correctly. You have to analyze earnings, adjusting for these for, for all sorts of changes in assumptions that the company may may do may make. Okay, so excessive M and A, uh, it's uh, you know I know that serial compounders are popular in um, in developed markets and, and maybe they're you know they can add value by uh, acquiring companies small companies cheaply, but in in Asia. Usually, excessive M&A is a red flag because 
uh, first of all, they might overpay. That's typically what happens in, in M&A, especially in competitive bidding situations. Uh, if you can check the, if they, if they announce the multiples paid, check that. I mean, you, if you can see what they're paying, you will get a sense of uh, whether the company is, is, is paying good price or not. For example, VTech, I know, is paying very low prices. Uh, so in their case, M&A usually adds value, in my view. But in most cases, uh, they, they might overpay. Uh, in Valiant Pharmaceuticals case, they, uh, they were not uh, having much R&D in-house. Instead, they were buying companies for, for, to buy intellectual property or, or drugs. And that's a problem. Um, well, it's not necessarily a problem, but, it, but you need to account for that. You need to deduct that, those, the cost of those acquisitions in your cash flow uh, metrics. And their cash flow, uh, non-gap cash flow metric didn't, didn't include those acquisitions. And that's just wrong. I mean, you, if, if they need acquisitions to maintain uni volumes, clearly, clearly um, the, those acquisitions are operating and, and it should be d deducted, you know, when you calculate cash flows or earnings. Um, and then the last and perhaps most important issue with M&A is that, you, you know, they might be funneling money out through related parties. And um, uh, I think that's extremely common in like state-owned enterprises in Vietnam, for example, but also in China, if they're acquiring lots of companies, why wouldn't they take a cut uh, out of those transactions? You know, it's such an easy thing to do. Uh, so anyway, what you can do is, okay, you look at M&A, if you have access to Bloomberg, CACS is the, is, is the function, and you check what transactions they've done. Uh, if it's too much, that, I guess that's just the red flag. You can also look at the return on invested capital, and if it goes down over time, that means the balance sheet is growing too fast, growing faster than earnings. And if the balance sheet is growing really fast, that means that the company is most likely hiding, hiding costs, hiding expenses. They're uh, acquiring companies, but they're not writing down the goodwill or uh, maybe they're doing, they're outsourcing R&D, stuff like that. Uh, so this is Alibaba here, Alibaba's uh, return on capital. I'm not saying it's a fraud at all, but it, 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 it is quite low at 8% using the operating profit line, not including the, the, the stuff below the operating profit. 8% uh, is, is a little bit weak. Uh, the key metrics, okay, this one is interesting. This is something that a few people do. Uh, the right-hand side, well, first of all, okay, so what you do here is you, you take the key building block of the business. Uh, yeah, you, you, you take the, uh, the business and you, you divide it into the key building blocks of the business. Sales volumes, employees, or number of outlets. And then you compare the accounting items to each of these blocks. For example, on the right-hand side, you have a company called Huazhu. And uh, they have uh, hotels, um, uh, both owned by themselves as well, as well as through franchisees. And the property, plant, and equipment of those hotels per hotel was way higher than reported by independent franchisees. Like a dif difference of... Um, uh, versus the credit report looks like 100 to 400 percent almost and that means that the pp &E was fake and they used that item i think to hide the fact that they didn't have much cash so the earnings were fake and the the pp &E item sucked up the cash you know figuratively speaking from the cash flow statement and uh and caused, you know explaining their low uh, low cash number um, so yeah, but I remember there was, I, I think John Hampton, he, um, I think it was John Hampton, he wrote a report on this uh, company in Heilongjiang, uh, stating that their PP&E per employee was something like $1,000, or maybe it was $2,000, uh, maybe just enough to pay for a computer per employee, uh, you know let alone for you know the vehicles and the properties and the machinery to actually produce the products so that does, just doesn't make any sense and um, in some cases frauds are just so obvious you know when you go into these uh, per unit basis um, 
ratios. So that's a good one. And another really fast thing to check. Um, yeah, I think it was Sinoforest who was uh, mentioned in the in the movie The China Hustle, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in any case, um, so bond yields um, or borrow costs are easy thing to check. Uh, if the borrow cost is really high, like 8% to 10%, above 10%, the company is not deemed credit worthy by, the, by, the, by creditors. And um, that is uh, problematic because, uh, first of all, they may not be able to get out of their, their, their debt. If, if their return on assets is extremely weak, let's say in the mid single digits, as was the case for Evergrande here, which I wrote about in 2018, and they were borrowing it over 10%, then it's hard to get out of their, your debt burden. You just keep on accumulating or compounding the, the debt. The other thing is here, creditors are smart, smarter than equity guys. And um, what I've found often is that they, they, they will look at the accounting in a much greater detail. And um, um, they might use, um, you know, they might be hiding debt in non-consolidated entities like joint ventures uh, or equity method subsidiaries. They might be using a very aggressive accounting. Um, and um, I think it's always a warning sign if, if a company has to borrow well over 10%, which, uh, which is often the case. It might just say that, that they have too much debt, I guess. Okay, and um, the last one here, no, sorry, the second to last uh, item here is interest income from cash. And you'd be surprised how often you find uh, a, a business in Asia that doesn't earn income is from on its cash. Um, you, can, you can check that by looking at the cash flow statement income interest received. And then you compare that to the uh, cash balance in the beginning of the year and the end of the year. You can take the average as a proxy of how much cash was in the bank accounts throughout the year. And if that interest, effective interest is like 0.2% uh, and the deposit rate in, in, in Indonesia is, you know, is maybe like 4% or let's say China maybe like 3%, then it's something wrong. Either the cash doesn't exist, it's a fake, fake, um, uh, fake, uh, fake account, fake bank statement, or what I think is very common is that they transfer cash at the last day of the year, and then it looks like they have a huge net cash position, you know, in their financial statements. But then you you know you don't see the actual cash interest uh, in in the uh, in the other in the accounts. Uh, so I think that's more common than we think, and fr probably not just in China. Uh, and the only way you can figure that out is by looking at the effective interest on, on cash. Finally, ca share count. And I like to go through um, Bloomberg, FA, you press number three, and then you check the, um, the, uh, the number of shares in the company over time. And you will find that the, uh, the number of shares tend to... Uh, Usually, if it's a good company, it tends to be flat or maybe decrease a little bit. If they're issuing shares year after year after year, it's probably something, uh, they're probably not very um, friendly to minority investors. Perhaps the management is, is trying to build an empire by issuing shares. Maybe they're using uh, sh new shares as, as an acquisition currency. As acquisitions are usually overpriced, let's be honest. And, and then uh, they could also, issue shares to uh, fund shortfalls of cash. Um, so usually not a good idea. I mean, if you believe that the shares are undervalued, you don't want them to issue shares. <laughs> that's just, that's as, as simple as that. And um, um, so I like to just pull up the chart of the share count. There could be stock splits as well, but usually, um, you know, if a company is announcing buybacks, uh, very often the case, you know, buybacks, but then you see, look at the share count and it's going up every year. You know, it's, it's probably, they're, they're probably just promotional trying to pump up the stock, I think. Okay. So these are the 10 things that I look at very fast. 
it gives you a sense of whether there are problems or not. And you can dig deeper if you want to. Um, but it's a start. And if you do this, I think you will, you, you will be on a good start. Uh, and out of those 10 metrics, I think the most important ones are, are really the, the operating margin. That's one thing. Like if it's, if it's a commodity product and they make 30% margin, that's a huge red flag. Second thing is cash flow. Like if the cash flows are, are strong, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the business is probably fine. And if they use that cash that they build up on the balance sheet for good purposes, like buying back shares, you're probably you're probably in good territory. The probably is, the company is probably decent. Uh, okay, so let's, this is a share share. This is a case study, and um, I will talk about the company as I looked at the accounts and how I would you know what I would kind of pay attention to, uh, just like I would without really knowing much about it. And and then I would look through. I will explain to you how Blue Orca, Sir and Ondal's business how they approach the, um, the analysis and what they eventually found out about the business. So Mega Expo was an event organizer based out of Hong Kong. Uh, rather, sorry, it was based in Shenzhen and Shanghai, but the, it was listed in Hong Kong. And the big company had amazing growth. Uh, I think it was set up in 2015 and out of nowhere, they, they, they built the business very fast and um, um, they made a number of acquisitions, seven acquisitions in less than two years, financed through capital markets. And um, somehow related to the, well, the CEO, he came from a boy band and somehow ended up running this business. I don't know exactly how he did that transition, but that was the story anyway. And uh, growth was amazing. You can see that in the, in the revenue growth here, doubling in a year. And the first thing here I would pay attention to uh, that I paid attention to was the fact that the operating margin is 38%, extremely high for a business that's a commodity service. They're, what they do was they sold equipment to bars and KTVs and, and such. And um, they also provided, there was, there was a talent agency and they also provided, provided consulting services. But in any case, 38% is really high. There's another company in the sector, exhibition industry, exhibition and events industry called Pico for East. And I think their margin is like 10%. So uh, that just doesn't make any sense. And um, tax rates is fine. I think they paid cash in, paid tax in Hong Kong. The next thing here is on the balance sheet, you find there was uh, goodwill uh, on the balance sheet. Um, I think I have, haven't written here, but it's about, about half of, of equity was, was in goodwill. And that goodwill arose through those acquisitions. Um, 70, 80% of the, of the consideration of those acquisitions was goodwill. And uh, not many other assets. Huge increase in receivables, uh, way faster than the revenue growth. So the company wasn't getting paid for its services. Uh, that's weird. And if you like, calculate the, the total amount of receivables, um, they were about 303 days of revenues. Um, maybe the revenue would grow a little bit, but still really, really high. And um, normally customers will pay within 90 days or, or you know, 30, 90 days, something like that. Also, they borrowed uh, in a corporate bond with an interest rate of 10%. And that suggests to me that lenders don't, didn't have a lot of confidence in the business. They had to pay a lot. To borrow money. Um, cash flow statements, they have negative cash flows for two years straight. They, they had net profit, but no cash flows. And the difference there was, was in receivables. That suggests that those receivables, that revenue recognition wasn't, wasn't appropriate. The revenue might have been fabricated uh, re and, and false. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, last, in the second part of the cash flow statements, acquisitions of subsidiaries and acquisitions of unlisted investment fund. That's just a typical, typical red flag. Acquisition of subsidiaries, you see that all the time in, in companies that recycle cash, uh, I think. I think that's what's going on. Uh, most likely, 
that money is going to um, to related parties. You can also see here that they, they've done uh, a number of uh, acquisitions. They're just sucking up cash. And um, effective deposit rate, I got to 0.2%. I think the cash was in on the mainland, which was would then be uh, you know just not reasonable. Uh, maybe the cash was fake. I'm not sure. Um, and the share share count increased every year. The reason was they had uh, equity offerings every single year, as well as acquisitions. Um, and um, yeah, they just kept issuing shares to, um, and God knows where that cash ended up. So let's look at the solution then. I mean, sorry, the, the answer. This is the Blue Orca's report uh, in, in 2019 what they found was that the seven acquisitions that they funded through uh, capital raises they were empty shells with no revenues no assets no track record in most cases uh, and 95% uh, of their revenues came from undisclosed related parties especially uh, an, an entertainment group called Noah's Ark which owned bars and KTVs in Shanghai and was also engaged in prostitution according to Blue Orca and um, they were unable to find any evidence of operations at two of of, of Mega Expo's key subsidiaries, and that's you know that's analysis that's hard to do as a long investor, but um, um, but anyway, this is what what, what was going on. Uh, they found that an empl an employee of uh, of one of the subsidiaries had an email address belonging to Noah's Ark, the uh, prostitution ring. Uh, or the uh, entertainment group, which might have been, you know, related to the mafia somehow. You can read the report; it's fantastic. Um, the appraiser and auditor behind Mega Expo had also been behind several of Hong Kong's largest frauds, and that's another huge red flag. They also made the case that the valuation was 22 times book, 13 times price sales. So that explains why the stock fell so much. This is. Uh, uh, the date of Blue Orca's report, it fell about uh, 50%. And then finally, in 2020, just before their 2020 fiscal 2020 earnings came out, the profits, the stock price fell, and then profits fell by 60%. So, um, so yeah, this is uh, this is that, that was my case study. And if you are interested in in learning more. I recommend these two books, and uh, I think they're great ways to to learn to um, figure out the quality of earnings. And um, if you look at a report, you know, of a company, don't take the growth numbers at face value. It's it's good to check to go through his list, Thornton or Globe's list, in his book, and and just adjust the the growth numbers for for changes in the assumptions accounting assumptions things like the depreciation schedule or or you know increase a fast growth in accounts receivables stuff like that so it's more about earnings manipulation and the second book on the right hand side here is called the art of short selling by Catherine Staley and I think it's a fantastic book maybe the best one ever written on on short selling how they um, apply financial analysis uh, in their campaigns and how they trade stocks all the way down to uh, to zero. So that concludes uh, my presentation today, and I'm so sorry about the <laughs> about the technical issues. I mean that was hugely um, uh, yeah that was a huge fail on my part. But hopefully next time it will be better. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to just ask them in the um, by typing into the chat window uh, at the top right corner of the screen and click send. And I'll try to answer them as, as well as I can, if you have any questions. Yeah, uh, you're mentioning a few, um, few cases of, of frauds. Orient Paper is a classic. That was the one that uh, Carson Block wrote on in 2011, I think, or maybe 2010. 
probably 2011. And uh, yeah, tons of companies like that in uh, in Hong Kong. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I like your work, by the way. I um, I'm gonna put up a, uh, this presentation on on the YouTube channel, um, and um, probably edit it a little bit. Uh, hopefully, for the for the people who view it, uh, view the recording, they will <laughs> they will get a better experience than what what you got. So, uh, apologies for this, and uh, and if you're interested in um, Short term, yeah, okay, so um, the first five points, let, let's go through to the agenda actually, just so you can see it from a top-down view here. So my 10 red flags here, operating cash flow, I think this is the key point here. Like you want to see actual cash flow, but it, you could also, I mean, you can, sometimes you can see operating cash flow, strong operating cash flow, but then there's something sucking up cash uh, in the, um, in the investing part of the cash flow statement. That's very often the case. Or, um, yeah, um, yeah, there, there, there are many ways that, that, uh, that companies can trick investors, but weak cash flows is, is typically a warning sign. Uh, and um, uh, next thing here, I think operating margins for commodity products like pipe manufacturers or like chowda, like the, the uh, vegetable producer, if they have high margins or if they, you know, a company producing like solar, solar panel, panel glass or something. Um, um, yeah, that's just not something I would, ex you know, accept at, at face value. Um, but it's so common. It, it is really common in Hong Kong listed equities. Uh, high accounts receivables, I, I would just look at the accounts receivable days or the increase in the growth of accounts receivables. If they're not getting paid, then something is wrong. Maybe they're either you know, providing um, uh, very lax credit terms or there's, there's some issue there with, um, um, with just the revenue recognition, that they're not doing it properly. They're accounting revenues for something that's for, for products that has hasn't be, haven't been delivered or uh, you know in other ways of, of inappropriate recognition of revenues. Inventories um, that's I think seen less common, but you can you can boost gross profit margin by playing around with the valuation of ending inventory. And if tax rates, I think the um, the key point there is if they're not paying taxes they probably don't have any taxable income. And if they don't have any taxable income, the, um, the, 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 the probably isn't much, much income to talk about. The, I think the um, tax authorities, they don't mess around. Like their, their standards are very strict. And um, so, um, so, so that's a huge red flag. So those were the, the five uh, first points. Uh, many small cap companies have accounting shenanigans. So how many shenanigans is okay for a business? I think honestly, okay. So if they don't have any operating cash flows, um, that that I mean, that that for me is enough. Like I. I I, I can imagine investing in a company that has had five years of negative operating cash flows. I'm not talking about free cash flow, I'm talking about operating cash flow. So that to me is, is, is a warning sign enough. If they're not paying tax at all, <laughs> that's, uh, that's also enough. So that's just one, one of those 10 uh, that I would look at. M&A, I mean, Okay, so let's let's say like these uh, pharma distributors in China, they have tons of M&A, Shanghai Pharma, or, or maybe, uh, you know, yeah, there are a bunch of them, Sino Pharma and so on. Like, if you look at their acquisitions, they have tons of acquisitions. And, but it's part of the business. Uh, I'm sure there's cash being taken for, you know, from the managers that are, that are, that are, um, that are running these businesses they're, they're probably taking a cut out of those transactions, probably. But 
uh, at the same time, you know, they make 10% return on equity or maybe a return on investor capital. And that's maybe that's fine because if you're paying five times earnings for, for the stock, maybe that's fine. Maybe. So I wouldn't, like M&A is not necessarily a deal breaker, at least not for me. And inventory increase, I, I would just dig deeper and figure out what's going on. For example, Lenovo had, a, you know, sometimes they've, they've been more aggressive with their accounting than other times, but they still produce real products. You know that they produce real products. Uh, you know that they're quite popular. So um, it depends then. I mean, are you paying a high price for the stock or are you just... Um, it, it really depends then on, on, I think, on, on what you're paying and if you're willing to to uh, to, to invest in a company that, that plays around a little bit with the assumptions, accounting assumptions. Uh, corporate bond yield, I think that's a deal breaker. Like if, if, they're, if they're borrowing... Uh, you know, at a very high interest rate, like Evergrande, and they have like net debt to EBITDA of whatever, five times or higher. Yeah, I would probably not do that unless maybe it's in Japan or something where um, where lenders are, are, are nicer. And then, uh, yeah, those are the, the key things. But rising share count, it may not be an issue necessarily. Um, I'm not really following the Silvergate scandal, uh, Sunanda. Um, but the only thing I can say about, uh, I'll get back to that on, on that protect. So the only thing I would say about Silvergate, because I don't really follow it, uh, is that um, I guess two things. One thing is, if you are, you know, if you're taking on a short seller like Aurelius. Or like Nathan Anderson, or Carson Block, or Cern Ondal, you better know what you're doing, because these guys they don't mess around. You typically don't stand a chance, you know, against a short seller who's serious, who has the resources, and has spent two or three months digging into a company. So taking the other side of that trade is personally not something that I would not do. There's no way I would do that, personally. Uh, so I don't know anything about Silvergate, but yeah, I, I mean Aurelius has really good. Uh, I think it's Aurelius, right? Who who is on the other side, who's who's selling the stock? Yeah, this there are easier 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 uh, uh, situations to get into, and financials are difficult because they're black boxes. Plus, you know, if they're involved in 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 businesses which are, um, you know, with unsavory characters, then. Maybe there's that's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't know, but I don't know the Silvergate situation myself enough to to tell. But I I personally stay away from from um, from anything to do with uh, with the cryptocurrencies and, and get rich quick schemes. Um, Tom asks about small caps. You've seen companies which accounting inconsistencies that pass most of the test. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I guess one thing I'll add there is, uh, okay, we all know that emerging markets are, tr are tricky. Uh, you, are, you can get tricked easily in, in, in Vietnam, for example. Yeah, um, like, um, so if you're investing in, in a country like Vietnam in a small cap, um, you are taking on big risks. So maybe some of the you know small caps they, they they pass these tests with flying colors what I I like to see is either share insider trades insider buys or buybacks because if a company is buying back shares in size there's only one reason for that and that's because they they think it's cheap and long term they want to reward minority shareholders they're buying into uh, you know the they see the corporate and the listed entity as uh, as as a company that will eventually benefit from 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 its cash flows. Otherwise, if you're an insider and you're buying back shares, you're just throwing money away. You might as well just steal that money. So if a company is buying back shares, that's a very positive sign. Uh, or if the company, if the if the manager management team is buying back shares itself in size, that's also a really positive sign. So. Um, 
I don't know how to weigh that necessarily, but if it's in a dodgy, uh, you know, jurisdiction, maybe um, that's also something that I would take into consideration. Other than, you know, of course, the quality of business and, you know, whether you, you like the products, whether they have some kind of moat, that kind of stuff. So uh, Pratik asks, why is low effective tax rate a red flag? I think the reason why is because uh, the effective tax rate is based on taxable uh, income as judged by the tax, tax authority. And if they don't have any, uh, if they don't have any effective tax paid, if they don't have any tax expense, that probably means that the, the tax authority doesn't think that they have any taxable income. And if they don't have any taxable income, they're probably not profitable. So that's the reason. So if if um, if the uh, effective tax rate is like five percent each year, year after year after year, and it's not a high tech business, there's no reason why it would have some kind of, uh, you know. This you know, any kind of uh, tax benefits, uh, and the tax paid, you know, is is also uh, similarly low. That's that's I think that's for me that's a huge issue, because uh, you know like like so I, I took the example of um, of Jean Ho. Um, they had one off gains, of course that's very obvious, right? You can just look at the. Uh, income statement and it will say other income or something like that you can see the gain there but uh, just an example you know I think in that case uh, I don't think they had much taxable income because you don't get taxed by changes in the assumptions of a model of a fair value of, of, a, of a property so um, yeah Equivalent, equivalent of SEC in Hong Kong, <laughs> SFC. Uh, yes, there is, but um, has the place improved against the final form? You know, the issue with Hong Kong, I think, is not the fact that the, the, there's not a rule of law. There is, but it's not that difficult for a company to acquire an asset on the mainland or acquire an asset in Indonesia or somewhere. And then they might be paying a uh, too high price for that asset, you know, double the price. And who's to say that that valuation is wrong? Uh, so that's a way to funnel money out of the out of the list out of the Hong Kong business. And if if bank statements are faked, um, I don't know if I, I don't know what SFC can do in Hong Kong. Or maybe they're all in this, you know, in the in the same, they're all in bed together. Uh, the stock exchange and the brokers and the and the issuing companies. I'm not sure. But the, it's certainly a treacherous uh, stock exchange to invest in. I think, yeah. If you if you have any more questions, feel free to ask them. But um, if not, I think we'll probably. Uh, call it today. It's already midnight here in Singapore. And uh, apologies once again for letting you wait for so long. I should have checked before uh, I went, uh, I did the whole presentation. Uh, and hopefully, if we do this again, I'll, I'll make sure that, uh, that you get a smoother experience from the live stream. Or maybe I use Zoom next time or something. And uh, yeah, if you're if you're interested in, in uh, Asian century stocks, you know, feel free to uh, you know, reach out to me or to check the website. Uh, if you're a subscriber, you get uh, this full disclosure of my personal portfolio and um, um, twenty reports at least every year uh, on on different value stocks in Asia Pacific uh, as well as other reports. So yeah, thank you so much for watching and uh, uh, thank you guys. And uh, I'll uh, I'll catch you next time. Yes, the presentation will be available to, to subscribers. I'll I'll probably link this to uh, tomorrow's Monday morning links. Okay, thank you so much.